It's been an exciting week for astronomy, not because there's been a particle physicist and his mates running around in a field in Cheshire, although that was fun too, those of you who watch Stargazing Live, um, but because this is the week in which the American Astronomical Society, which is actually the largest gathering of professional astronomers that takes place uh, every year, has been happening. And that means that there has been lots of news about astronomy. Uh, and in particular, there's been lots of discoveries and discussion of things called exoplanets, planets around other stars. And that's what I want to talk to you about uh, and just give you an update, really, on the status of our search for other worlds. So this is a picture of the Milky Way. Probably you've already seen this several times today. Uh, our galaxy, of course, has 100 billion or so stars in it. It's a lot. Um, and we now know something that we didn't know a couple of years ago, which is that most of those stars seem to have planets. So we, the solar system and the sun aren't that special, perhaps. And so, for example, this week there was a press release that produced a lot of coverage, uh, like this. This is from Smithsonian. I like the headline, you can't throw a rock in the Milky Way without hitting an Earth-like planet. That's sort of true here. It's not literally true in many other places. But the claim from a new paper from a bunch of astronomers at Harvard was that according to a new estimate, our little corner of the universe, the Milky Way galaxy, and therefore we assume other galaxies, is home to a whopping, scientific term means big, um, 17 billion, 17 billion Earth-like planets, rocky orbs about the same size as ours. So that works out about one potential Earth per every six stars. And so what I want to talk about is the science behind this, which isn't quite true. Because, you see, it's this word Earth-like that's a problem. What does it mean for a planet to be Earth-like? We can imagine a very stringent definition. You could say that to be Earth-like, you need to have a Oxford with a physics department and a bunch of extremely intelligent and witty astronomers in it. <laughs> Our planet would only just meet that definition. Um, you might say, well, look, anything that goes around a star is a planet. That's good enough for me. But what I think we mean by Earth-like is a planet that has a rocky surface, a surface I can stand on, that want to sink through Jupiter, um, but also one that could support life. We don't know the details of that, but let's agree for now that to support life, you need liquid water. We, there are all sorts of good reasons, and I'll answer in the questions if you like, to believe that you need water to have life. And so that means the planet has to be in what's called the habitable zone, or my, the term I much more prefer, the Goldilocks zone, the region of space that's not too hot and not too cold. You got the Goldilocks reference? Good. Um, not too hot, not too cold, but the right temperature for liquid water. So in our solar system, uh, Mars is too cold, just. Venus is too hot, but Earth is just right. And this report isn't about that, and I'll explain why. Before I do that, I have to talk about how we hunt planets. And in case I forget, I need to tell you that we need your help to try and find planets around other stars. We have a website that's run by a team here in Oxford, along with colleagues in Chicago and at Yale, called planethunters.org, which does what it says on the tin. We take data from a space telescope called Kepler, and we put it on the web for everyone to help us sort through. And Kepler has the most boring job in astronomy. All it does is it stares at a single patch of sky, and every 29 minutes, it tells us how bright each of 150,000 stars are. How does that help us find planets? Well, sometimes a planet, as it orbits its star, will pass in front of the sun, or pass in front of its sun. This happened to Venus, uh, as seen from Earth in 2012. Um, that's last year. Um, and when this happens, if you're plotting the brightness of the star, then you see this dip. We call this dip a transit. And maybe that might have been coincidence, maybe something else is going on. But if you see this transit repeat, then you know there's a planet. And it will repeat once every time a planet goes in front of its star. And so planet hunters, and indeed Kepler as a whole, this space telescope, is an attempt to find these transits. And they've been spectacularly successful. So this is the state of the art last year. So in our quest for Earth-like planets, the first thing I said was I wanted them to be rocky. So let's see whether we have rocky planets. Well, um, Kepler has found... This is 2012, 71 larger than Jupiter, 210 about Jupiter-sized. Uh, 
The winner is Neptune-sized planets, seem the most common. Then so a bit bigger than Earth, and then some which are less than one and a quarter times the size of the Earth. And when you get down here, these small planets, we think, have to be rocky. So it's this end that we're interested in. This week, this graph changed. So the 2013 version looks like this. So Neptune's still in the lead. Jupiter-sized planets have fallen back a bit. And we've got an in actually the biggest increase is in the number of Earth-sized planets. So it's this number that that 17 billion is based on. So we've got uh, 351 outer Earth-sized planets we've already seen around the Kepler stars. And if you do some multiplication for all the stars in the galaxy, you get the 17 billion. So at first glance, the journalists are right. We've got Earth-like planets. But this is my second criteria, the Goldilocks zone. We need these planets. It's no good these being Earth-like if they're scorching hot, if they're as hot as Mercury or even hotter. And Kepler concentrates on, so far, on planets that are close to their parent star. Now, that's not a mistake. That's a consequence of the experiment that it's doing. Remember I said that you need that transit signal to repeat. So you need to see not one transit, but actually the rule is three. If you see it three times, it must be true. Something like that. We, there's a scientific version of that. Um, but if you see three, and so if you're watching Earth, imagine you're on a distant star looking back towards Earth, then you'd have to wait three years for Earth to go around three times before you'd see your three transits. And this, these results are based on just over three years' worth of data. So all of these planets are much closer to their parent stars than the Earth is to the Sun. And all we've found so far in the habitable zone are big planets. We announced one this week, for example. This is an artist's impression of a planet that's now called Planet Hunters 2b. It's a terrible name. You should never let astronomers name anything. Let's call it Keith for the purposes of this lecture. Uh, Keith is a Jupiter-sized planet, um, but it sits in this Goldilocks zone. So we've got the Goldilocks bit, but it's not rocky. But you might imagine that Keith might have a moon, and it might have a moon the size of the Earth. It might not, but let's assume it does. That's what we're drawing here. And if those moons exist around these Jupiter-sized planets, then they may be places where life could get started. And what's interesting is this week, thanks to the efforts of planet hunters, we found actually Keith is the one that we know most about. We're 99.99% sure. And I mean that. That's a measurement, not hyperbole. 99.99% uh, sure that Keith actually exists. Um, I'm always going to call it Keith from now on. Um, but we also have another 15 giant planets in the habitable zone. And Kepler have another 40 that we're 90% sure are real. So most of them are. And if you think about it, if in our precious little Goldilocks zone, you have a giant habitable planet, a giant, sorry, a giant uh, gas planet, then there's not much space left for a rocky planet like Earth. So it may be, we don't know yet, but it may be that rocky planets, Earth-like planets, are rare in the habitable zone. And that's going to be the big challenge for 2013 as we update that graph again, is to try and understand whether that's true or not. Can we really find some rocky planets or are the habitable zones dominated by these giant gas giant, giant planets? How long have I got left? Three minutes. About three minutes. Good. Excellent. No, I haven't finished. I have a more structured talk. So where do these planets come from? How come we've got Jupiter in the habitable zone? Why is Keith so large and so close to the sun? Because when you look at our solar system, you've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And so we came up with the perfectly sensible theory that rocky planets live close to their parent star, and gas planets live further away. And actually, this makes sense, because close to the star, when the planets are forming, the gas is heated up, and it gets expelled from the inner solar system. So there's no gas here. It's all out here. So big planets, like Jupiter and like Keith, have to form out in the outer solar system. But how on earth are they up? How did, they, how did Keith migrate inwards to where Earth is? Well. If you look at a young star, and this is Fomalhaut, this is a bright star in the southern sky, um, and actually what we've done here is we've blocked out the light from Fomalhaut, so you can see faint things around it. And what you can see is a dusty disk of material, and it's from a dusty disk like this that planets form. The dust grains, which are no bigger than sand grains to begin with, begin to stick together, and they build up to form things that are about this size, 
then we don't understand what happens, but let me click my fingers and we'll magically get to things that are this size. And when you get to things that are this size, then they begin to stick together again. It's this problem. We don't understand how planets form, but that's fine. Um, but, but these things, let's assume that, that the, in, in this dust disk, you build up bigger and bigger planets. Now, there's also, if you form your planets very quickly, then they suffer friction from the rest of the dust. And that friction takes energy away from the planets and they spiral inwards towards the central star. So we think that Keith and the other hot gaseous planets that we found have migrated inwards towards their parent star, presumably pushing out any new rocky planets that have formed in the same system. And so this is a violent process. And now the mystery is why our solar system is unusual. One of the ways to answer that is to look all over the galaxy for as many unusual planetary systems as we can find. Because it's the unusual ones that will explain to us how planets themselves form. And we found just such a system a couple of, uh, a couple of um, months ago. This is uh, Planet Hunters 1b. So let astronomers name thing. Let's call it Susan for the purposes of this talk. So Susan is uh, smaller than Keith. Uh, Susan is a Neptune-sized world. But what's remarkable about Susan is that this is a planet with not one, not two, not three, but four suns in its sky. Susan orbits a double star. That's two stars in tight orbit around each other. And then outside that orbit, you have this Neptune-sized world. And if that's not enough, a bit further away, you have two other stars also in orbit around each other, orbiting the whole thing. So you have this four-star system in which this giant planet, Susan, has managed to form. And we don't really understand how that could have happened. If we run the computer simulations, we find that the disk of material that I showed you around Formalhort should be disrupted by the gravitational pull of these four stars. Once you form a planet, you're OK. But the disk should have been ripped apart. And it wasn't. And so that must be telling we still managed to form a planet. So that must be telling us something we don't understand about planet formation. And it's now a big challenge to try and work out how Susan came to be where it is. The most remarkable discoveries in science, we, the, the most progress, is made not when somebody has a smart idea, but when there's an observation that we don't understand. And thanks to planet hunters, and thanks to Kepler, and thanks to the efforts of now more than 200,000 people who've gone to our website, and I expect you all to join them and try and help us find a planet, we're beginning to find plenty of places in the universe where there are planets that we just don't understand. Thank you very much. <laughs>